this is something that I got into when I was um, in the government. In 2015, um, President Obama was hearing a lot about AI from a lot of people um, and probably hearing you know, a disproportionate amount from people like Elon Musk that were really afraid the robots were going to destroy all of us and do things like that. I don't think that was what the president really thought, but he asked us to um, look into it and come up with a framework on it. And it's something the Office of Science and Technology Policy did um, an excellent effort putting out a report towards the end of the administration on a strategy for AI going forward. Um, I was at the Council of Economic Advisors. We were very involved in that. Um, Rob Siemens, who's here, was, was helping out um, at an earlier stage of that work. Um, and then we did a report on the economic side of AI. Um, it's a hard topic to talk about today because every one of the papers I've heard today, and I wasn't able to make it yesterday, have had all sorts of really rich considerations um, around policy issues. And in some sense, one of my messages is going to be, it's not like there is an AI policy consideration. There's a lot of different conversations um, going, on, going on in different areas. Um, and to some degree, the common theme is really specific to each of those areas um, as opposed to um, specific to AI. So what I'm going to try to do is talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that I've worked on in the past and thinking about um, now and talk about these, um, these types of considerations. The first is a lot of these conversations begin with sort of how do you, you know, curb AI, make sure it doesn't kill all of us, make sure it's not really biased, unfair, you know, whatever else. Um, but I'll start with what I think the biggest problem is, which is low productivity growth and what can AI do to solve it and what role for public policy is there. Um, then I'm going to talk in general, I think you actually want to base policy on the present, um, not on the future, and I'll talk about why. Um, then, you know, sort of undermining the whole point of this session, talking about, you know, in some ways you shouldn't have AI policy considerations. You have considerations in lots of different domains, and AI is an ingredient into that. Um, on a lot of things, when you do have them, you really want to compare machines to humans. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone in this room. Um, we just had that conversation in terms of accident rates for autonomous vehicles. It can be more of a surprise outside of it. Um, and then the last is a catch-all for like every other discussion we've had today, um, which is there are all sorts of interesting things, um, some tiny subset of which I will talk about. So starting, oh, oops, pressing the wrong button. So starting with uh, we need more um, AI. You know, I spend time with macroeconomists who are all really dour about where the economy is and how it's doing. And then I go to hear presentations like the one we just heard on self-driving vehicles. And it all seems really positive and optimistic. Um, just to look at the macro data over the last decade, um, productivity growth has slowed in all of the advanced economies. This is the sort of dominant thing people are worried about um, in macro is understanding why that happened. Um, what can be done about it. There's a whole lot of different explanations. Some um, fall out from the financial crisis, some running out of ideas. Um, Halvarian um, has mismeasurement. I think most of the world thinks, at least for the two periods I've shown there, mismeasurement would shift up the blue and the orange bars. Um, wouldn't really change the distance between them, might even make it um, larger. But in general, what we've seen, the surprise in the recovery we just had across a lot of countries, was jobs performed similar to what we would have expected. GDP was a lot lower than what we expected, which is the exact opposite of what you'd get in a world of automation and robots. There you would expect um, a lot of GDP and um, not a lot of jobs. So we still have a lot of shortfalls in terms of automation. Um, why private, private investment is the vast bulk of what's going into um, you know, AI. Um, we heard about the resources you could have at a university versus at Uber for something like vehicles. Um, but just like any area of R&D, um, the spillovers, and you can have um, things like tax, uh, R&D tax credits, um, innovation boxes. You can talk about pros and cons, um, about mo pros mostly of the former, cons mostly of the latter. Um, there's a set of issues specific to AI around cybersecurity, um, spillovers from data, and sort of negative spillovers you could get, where one company does something badly. Um, and it can end up hurting everyone else um, in the space, which wouldn't be the standard R&D. Um, there's even questions of how you define the property rights around data. And when those are insufficiently defined, um, you can't reach the efficient equilibrium. And then one that economists don't think a lot about, because we tend not to believe this, 
but every policymaker is really focused on um, is number four. Um, the other way to frame number four would be China, which has set the goal of being dominant in AI um, in the year 2030. Um, my own you know, personal um, you know, hunch would be that's a good thing that China's trying to do that. And the more successful they are, it's really hard to keep these ideas. And we'll figure out something, reverse engineer it, um, and maybe have a period where we're catching up with others rather than them catching up with us. Um, but there's a number of people, mostly non-economists, who take the strategic competition um, and first mover really much more serious. And I think it's worth economists trying to think about it and think, if it's true, what it would mean um, for what we should do. Um, so I talked about tax incentives, um, basic research, um, cybersecurity and privacy roles, um, and then that national effort with you know, a big question mark around it to respond um, to the last one. So I'd always start the conversation there. I'm not saying those are all the policy answers, but you know, what can policymakers do to make sure we have more of this um, it has all sorts of downsides, problems. People talk a lot about those downsides and problems. Most of those are in the, the high class problem category. Um, so now I want to talk about basing policy on the present and wanted to use um, the example of the labor market and what it is we can do about um, the labor market. Um, Oh, I think the slide's missing. But anyway, um, picture you know, all the headlines you've seen of robots after our jobs. And there's 8 million of them. We're trying to figure out uh, only some fraction of them off of Duran's paper, but a sizable fraction. Um, 1980, we thought robots were after our jobs. 1960, we thought robots were after our jobs. 1935, we thought robots were after our jobs. We've now covered all the major newspapers um, in the country. And in 1812, we were worried about um, the Luddites as well. I'm not saying I know the answer to this question, but we've made a lot of very bad predictions about the future of the labor market. Um, we haven't just made bad predictions about the future of the labor market. We've also even misunderstood the past of the labor market um, because we haven't um, looked at it. You know, the large majority of employment is still in traditional employment arrangements. There's tons of discussion of gig economy. It um, doesn't appear that it's even necessarily growing um, nearly as much as we think. Even if it is growing, it just isn't where um, most of the jobs are. Um, there's some evidence David Deming has um, a paper that will be, a uh, working paper will be out soon on jobs changing less quickly um, than in the past. Um, you know, this, another uh, David Deming paper from QJE last year, is you know, STEM jobs actually fell from 1980 to 2012, while jobs that requiring social interactions grew. This comes as a big surprise to a lot of people, which is to say, like, if you can't know what actually happened in the past, how are you going to start speculating um, about the future? Um, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, how to connect people to jobs is a complicated thing. We don't know the exact answers to it. Economics has shifted and policy has shifted much more towards being based on evidence, being based on you know, RCTs and other well-identified strategies. Um, and it's impossible to do an RCT on the future. So if you want to figure out the labor market, and you want to figure out you know, what training program works, what apprenticeship, what connecting someone to some job, rather than trying to base that on your own highly imperfect guess on what the world will be like 20 years from now, and even conditional on your guess about the world 20 years from now being correct, you still couldn't understand um, exactly what that means for policy. If we got it right for where we are today, we'd be in pretty good shape um, for the future, um, much better than we are now. Now, none of this is to say everything's great um, in the labor market. This is the labor force participation rate for prime age men. Over 60 years, it's declined from the high 90s to the high 80s. It's sort of like having four recessions, none of which we ever recovered from, spread over a several decade period. I think that's one of the really big problems for economic policy. Some of the changes associated with automation may contribute to that, um, but I don't know that they change that much what you'd want to do in the labor market. And as I said, even if they did, I don't know that we'd understand it well enough um, to do it without looking at the actual data. So I think what it lends you to is sort of a now more than everism. Like you can talk a lot about robots. You can scare people about robots. You can talk a lot about the future of work. Um, but when it comes down to it, your policy actually is more about the present of work 
grounded in RCTs in the recent past of work. Um, so the third one is um, should not have AI policy um, considerations. And you know, the question here is, you know, are we regulating a tool or are we regulating in um, different domains? You know, there wasn't a big conversation about needing to have you know, a regulator for linear regressions and some body that looked over linear regressions and tried to understand all the implications of them and what is our policy to deal with linear regressions. Um, you know, so it's a tool. It's not you know, a specific thing. If you had people that understand this tool really, really well, they're still not going to understand super well all the different domains, whether it's automobiles or the SE, you know, trading in the stock market, um, medicine and medical devices, um, and the like. Even if they did, how would you coordinate um, between the FDA and the AI people, the NHTSA and the AI people, the SEC um, and the AI people? And you'd start to worry that um, you know, a bias towards permissionless innovation has been central to the technological progress we make. And so if you start to sort of treat AI as some different, magical, scary thing that needs its own policy response, um, you'd start to get in the way of that, um, as opposed to dealing with the things um, that AI does. So to take a specific example, which is automated vehicles, in September 2016, um, we came out with our federated, uh, federal automated vehicles policy. Um, I'm not saying this by way of bragging, but in my eight years of the Obama administration, we'd often like worry about this group being, you know, the like people would be upset, we'd be bailing out the banks, the banks would be upset that we were socialists, we'd figure out something in the middle and like they'd all hate us. Um, this was the only one I ever worked on where like all the different sides were actually quite happy. Um, the auto people, the safety people, um, the more regulatory inclined. So it sort of threaded a needle in an effective way. Um, last year, the Trump administration came out with an update. It had you know, a bit less regulation. I'd view it actually more as a continuation um, of what we did and, and a relatively serious one, but people could discuss that um, if they wanted to. To understand these, it's important to understand what NHTSA is. They're the domain-specific authority for safety on the roads. Um, they mandate specific features. They investigate issues. They do tests. They provide information. They provide guidance and standards, including, um, across, uh, including working um, across states. And so they do all of that. Um, then the other big part of our system is um, the legal system. And if you have a problem with a car you make, you can lose a lot, a lot, a lot of money um, in lawsuits. So the combination of regulation and torts has been the way that we have made automobiles increasingly safer um, up until um, the last decade or so when we let people take phones into their automobiles. So um, if you look at NHTSA, they have a history of technologies like seat belts, airbags, electronic stability control. Um, that they've made mandatory. They didn't invent any of those um, technologies. They didn't develop them. They might have created, in some cases, incentives to come up with them by standardizing information about performance um, and crashes and safety. So I think their regulations were more complementary to those investments um, than they were substitutions. But what they did was they sort of looked at things. Once they were cheap enough, widespread enough, um, they would mandate them. Um, and then there's an awful lot of optional stuff that has been developed um, over the decades, too, with towards the end there, things like active um, avoidance systems being ones that, um, in some cases, embody machine learning. Um, almost all of them you know, were, were developed by automakers, and then they were subsequently standardized and regulated. So the order was have an incentive to come up with this with some standardized information about it. Let there be a certain amount of innovation. If your innovation goes wrong, you might get shut down by NHTSA. You might get sued. And if it goes right and it's cheap enough, um, they'll make everyone have to do it as well. The view is that that type of model is going to work reasonably well um, for automated vehicles um, as well. Um, have some guidance about them have a model state policy so you don't have lots of different states doing different things, particularly in terms of how you're testing them. 
um, use their current regulatory tools. And we put out for comment um, some new tools and authorities, which actually I think were much less central to what we put out than one through three. Um, the Trump administration mostly walked back um, from number four and put in place um, and dropped some things like ethics and privacy, um, which we thought were, I correctly thought were important, um, but largely stuck with um, the majority of the standard driving related um, ones. And you could argue you know, where that is. I'm not defending the exact policy. But again, the approach is, you, know, this is a, you have a specific domain. It's coped with a lot of new technologies in the past. Use the same type of approach, um, but give a lot of thought to how it is adapted um, here. Um, in the course of that, um, something that I don't think anyone in this room would really disagree with is you want to um, you know, compare machines to humans. Um, machines have all you know, sorts of biases and problems. Um, they're also really hard to understand why it is they did what they did. Um, humans have all sorts of biases and problems. It's also hard to understand you know, why they do um, what they did, um, except I guess in the model we saw earlier where both of those were, were really good calculators. Um, you know, this is, you know, I was in one meeting where somebody thought they were sort of really smart and with it with economics because they said, oh, you know, we shouldn't deploy self-driving cars. We don't need them to be perfectly safe. As long as they're as safe as humans, um, we should deploy them. With a number of these technologies, we should remember that we're maximizing on um, tooth papers. This is Kleinberg et al. So with Sendel and Jan, so I currently hopefully safely driving um, their way back to Chicago. Um, these dots are different judges in terms of um, where they are on pretrial detention decisions, where you're trading off a decline in crime versus not wanting to incarcerate um, too many people prior to having a trial. Um, there's some frontier that you're making that trade off on. Machine learning uh, makes that trade off much better. Um, we should think about that in the same way in the context of autos. Should we wait until they're better than humans to deploy them? Um, no, that would be actually waiting too long. Um, one, they're much more convenient than humans. So even if they had more accidents, we should be willing to have them. Um, we could lower the speed limit to 15 miles an hour and save about a million people a year. We choose not to do that because our policy constantly um, has a safety convenience trade-off. So even that standard is worse. And then there's dynamic considerations. Um, finally, um, AIs will um, and will continue to raise novel issues in multiple um, policy domains. I wanted to talk briefly about um, competition policy. I'm leading a review for the UK Treasury on this topic, so anyone who has ideas come to me and I'm planning to come to a number of the people in this room on this. Um, digital technologies can reduce fixed costs and thus barriers to entry, um, but they've also led to competition for the market, direct and indirect network effects. Um, Hal has a view on that. I'm sure we'll hear it. Um, I think a certain amount comes down to what you think the returns to scale in data are. Is it decreasing returns to scale, in which case you'd be less worried? Is it as Posner and Weil um, say, based on talking to computer scientists, that um, machine learning has this feature that you get to, you know, you need certain scales of data before you can do anything. And so over some um, ranges, you have increasing returns to scale. Um, we talked a little bit about algorithmic um, collusion. I was just putting a question mark on it. I now know a tiny bit more um, than I knew this morning about it. And um, then finally, wanted to conclude on something that's not unique to this policy area. Every policy I've ever worked on, we're pretty unsure of, and we don't know everything we need to do, know to do it. Um, in fact, we know a tiny fraction of it, but you sort of need to do it. Um, I don't think you know more research is always needed, but we can't wait on everything till the third annual conference of this group. Um, we never have certainty. In the technological space, this has often been interpreted as don't do anything now because we're not sure. Um, all I'd want to point out is with some things, they're irreversible. So when Facebook acquires Instagram and WhatsApp, it's much harder to undo that than it would have been to block it. There is an option value of waiting argument for saying, you know what, you can't do that acquisition. If we're wrong, that's a little bit of an error in five years, we can correct it. Um, if we're right, we help nurture another competitor that could come in the market. So I'd urge us not to be too conservative and afraid of our uncertainty um, in moving into this area, but also not too sure of ourselves that we start asking people for too much permission to innovate. Thank you.
Okay, great. So um, thank you for having me and um, thank you, Jason, um, for presenting that. I'm, uh, let me just briefly recap Jason's AI policy considerations. This is just taking them out of the crimson and into the blue uh, <laughs> for my uh, acquire. So he talked about needing more AI, uh, basing policy on the present, the, f the idea that we should not have AI-specific policy considerations and in should instead rely on domain-specific regulation. We should compare humans to machines and that uh, we have novel issues in multiple policy domains. So it wouldn't surprise you that I actually mostly agree with Jason on uh, almost everything that he said, and I'm certainly not going to take Jason on on labor and macro. So let me uh, turn my attention to the things where um, I have a couple of opinions. So I'm going to focus here on this issue of domain-specific regulation and the raising novel issues in multiple policy domains. So about the domain-specific regulation, I do mostly uh, agree with Jason that we have a regulatory infrastructure and the idea that we would have a czar of AI seems like a pretty bad idea. I'm not as convinced as Jason is that a czar of regressions, by the way, would be such a bad idea. But um, I, I, I do completely agree with his point that you know if we have an AI czar, we are going to have a czar that has you know less information than any of the domain-specific regulators that we currently have in place. That being said, I do think it's worth illustrating a little bit of a trade-off. And I might have a taste for a little bit more of an effort of cross-agency uh, cooperation on AI maybe than we would uh, otherwise have. That second issue. Oh, I, but, but no, the, I think that's not true because uh, the administration, I saw an interview with the head of OIRA and the administration has abandoned this. Oh, unless it's now just zero, but yeah, yeah okay. Um, so agencies tend, you know, if we look across federal agencies in the U.S., and this may um, probably be true in, in a lot of other large countries that have to split these things up, you know, in the U.S., agencies use different values of a statistical life. You, know, you look across agencies, they're thinking about trade-offs, they use different values of statistical life. Uh, Jason, I know the previous administration made an attempt uh, to get the various agencies to agree on a uniform shadow cost of carbon. I actually believe that has been withdrawn, but we can discuss. Uh, agencies clearly have different implicit views on competition policy, so how tolerant they are of regulations that might change the level of competition. And so they are likely to put different weights on innovation incentives and outcomes. Right, so Jason mentioned this point, which I think we would all agree that you want to actually err on the side of permissiveness in innovation because you know, if you allow the self-driving cars, you, will, you allow the opportunity to learn about self-driving cars. And I, I, I mostly agree about domain-specific regulation, but I think just like the admin previous administration thought it was important to have some discussion of, you know, could we have a uniform shadow cost of carbon? I would also say that in the AI domain, there's something to be said for some cross-agency sort of agreement on how important or how much should we weigh innovation incentives when making trade-offs. Oh, did I turn something off? Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, and of course, don't even get me started when we're thinking about domain-specific sp regulation on this uh, heterogeneity across the states. So when we think about domain-specific regulation, Jason emphasized domain-specific expertise. I agree with that. But there's a little bit of a trade-off between domain-specific expertise and domain-specific trade-offs. Okay. Um, and so that's an argument for some coordinating mechanisms, but not a lot. Okay, let me turn to number five, which is that AI is and will continue to raise novel issues in multiple policy domains. I can't obviously argue with that particular statement, but let me just comment on a couple of those domains. 
Uh, Jason mentioned this issue of data as a potential barrier to entry, increasing returns to scale. Some people have framed that as a question of data as an essential facility and using a regulatory structure to kind of, uh, in, as a competition policy to kind of uh, increase the sharing of data. I won't repeat what I said on that topic last year. Uh, you can read my written comments from the previous year's uh, conference, I think an issue about that, which um, I think Jason would agree with, I'm just fleshing it out, is you know an issue with data as an essential facility or regulation around data is that it's hard to do a light structural kind of regulation, that if you're doing this kind of regulation, you're really talking about heavy duty price regulation or you know a kind of ongoing regulation. And so if you want to do that, you know, understand that if you're in for a penny on that, you're in for a pound. Um, a question which I think is interesting and is, comes out of what Jason said is, should or could we evaluate mergers or concentration differently in machine learning or AI intensive industries? Um, right now, I don't actually see what the argument is for the answer to that being yes. The FTC is organized a set of hearings on this topic of how we think, should we be thinking differently about competition policy in the new economy? And I actually think they're gonna be great hearings. A lot of good people at the FTC are working hard on them. So maybe next year uh, I'll have something to say on that. And then let me quickly briefly turn to another policy domain that you know, on the theme of AI is, implicates policy in multiple domains and turn to one that I think is worth considering for your attention. So AI technology, I think, in many use cases is complementary to communications technology. Uh, we heard at lunch that the approach that we might take with automated vehicles would be somewhat different if the communications technology was infallible. Right? If the communications te te technology is not infallible, then we have to build more into the individual unit. So many of applications of AI, such as aut autonomous driving, rely on remote data processing and intense communication among AI assets. Not all of them, but many of them. And obviously, cellular communications technology is rapidly advancing. Uh, 5G will offer vast improvements in speed, latency, and the ability to use diverse spectrum. We are here at a conference on AI, as a, in part because we have a disparate group here because we think AI has this role as a general purpose technology. One could similarly imagine us all at a conference on the topic of 5G as a general purpose technology and thinking about the ways that it's gonna impact all of us, okay? So, of course, AI is actually an input to communications technology. It's gonna play an important role in orchestrating orchestrating network resources. But when we think about the question of we need more AI and what regulatory domains are going to impact that, I just quickly want to note that bottlenecks and limitations to AI deployment may not come from our speed of advancement in AI technology, but in the speed of advancement of the capabilities and capacities of the communications infrastructure. I see Shane is nodding his head, so good, give me the thumbs up. Um, so, general, so while general tech, and my point is, while general technologies li like AI may appropriately be lightly regulated, we sure know that communications policy is not a thing that is or ever can be lightly regulated. It's you know, intensely regulated in most economies. This is my last slide. Um, so what are those domains? Spectrum policy, international competition, cooperation, you know, communications policy relies a lot on international cooperation, and local infrastructure issues. So if you're thinking about you know, policies to advance AI, you probably want to be thinking about these communication policies, which are, again, necessarily heavily regulated. Okay, thanks. Thank you.